So when I was a grad student, uh, I carried this book around with me in my backpack. And it's a summary of the uh, uh, experimental limitations, you know, the theory behind the question, how sensitive can a detector of motion uh, ever be? And this was motivated by gravitational wave detection. And the, um, you know, the physics uh, uh, that, that's in this book is all from Carlton Caves and Berginsky and Thorne and Drever and all these guys. And this is the largely set the program for what I would do when I had my own laboratory. And my students and we, we just joke that now we're on chapter 10, we're doing back action evasion, and we're pretty much out of pages. That's, that's the, end of the end of our story. Um, the experiments that I admired when I was a student were things like this. A one-ton object where people were measuring the uh, displacements to within 100 of the uncertainty principle of a ton object. Right? That's, that's remarkable. And then we all know about LIGO and its remarkable uh, measurements of gravitational waves, and they work right at the standard quantum limit. Okay, so that was motivating to me, um, and I always kind of watched this stuff in the background, uh, what was happening, and found it really interesting. Other, from the other direction, from the direction of the microscopic world, there were people, uh, let's say in Zeilinger's lab in Vienna, who were doing matter wave interferometry with small particles, and you know you can start with photons and electrons and neutrons and, and you see interference and do all that and then you can start to think about well how big of a particle can I use and eventually they were putting buckyballs in their interferometers and seeing interference fringes start to appear and ultimately bigger molecules uh, I think I have on there uh, 100, 430 atoms and seeing uh, the, the matter wave interference of that that's fantastic and when you talk to these guys their goal was to eventually have virus particles uh, diffracting on the slits of their device. And that's just like fantastic, right? It's so good. But it turns out that the van der Waals interaction of the, vir the larger particles interact with the slits. The slits start acting like lenses, and the interference is, is becomes uh, obscured. So inner micromechanics, devices like this, uh, when I first started making things like this, when I uh, had my lab at LPS at, at University of Maryland in the NSA, I was making tiny wires, uh, narrow wires, 20 microns long, um, 100 nanometer cross section, and coupling them to various superconducting electronic devices to, to work as readouts near the quantum limit and start to cool their motion down to the ground state. And eventually these wires were overtaken by a better design that has stronger coupling. And these were device, device, devices coming from uh, Gila, or sorry, yeah, Agila and NIST in, uh, in Boulder. And eventually we got on board with that too. And so what you see there is just a, a plate, a capacitor in, in a microwave LC circuit. Since then, there's a whole pile of experiments, a lot of them optical, some of them are silicon nitride membranes that vibrate, uh, some of them are little photonic crystals that vibrate, but in the end, they're all the same, they're just a mechanical mode coupled to some electromagnetic mode, and that's, that's the, the story. So, where are we in this field? Well, you can now make, you can go to the clean room, make a mechanical device, uh, it might have resonant frequencies of, of uh, a megahertz or a, uh, a few gigahertz. And by applying light of various types, whether it's optical light or microwaves, you can just cool it down to the ground state. Okay, all right. So the discussions we had in grad school about cooling mechanical things to the ground state, it's basically now just achievable. The grad students who show up all assume that mechanics, you're going to be working the quantum limit. They, they have no idea that this was crazy 15 years ago. Uh, we can detect motion at the standard quantum limit, so that means perfect amplifiers and detectors of the optical signals, whether microwave or optical frequency, of the outgoing waves. So you can do that. Uh, and you can actually probe them strong enough that you know, you're, you're, you're getting that kind of uh, information down at the, at the uncertainty, uncertainty principle limit. So you can detect at the SQL. Um, you, can, you can couple so strongly that the mechanical device is coupled to the quantum fluctuations of the field you're applying. Which is very, it's the same way of saying that if I shined a laser at something and caused it to be pushed, that's the ponder motive pressure or radiation force, but imagine I could detect the impact of individual photons and see it shake. That's what we're talking about here. So you can do that now. You can just make a device in the clean room, put it down in your dilution fridge, run microwaves through it, and watch it shake due to the quantization of the microwave field. OK, so OK, that's doable. That's like chapter two or whatever in Berginsky's book. Um, so yeah, you can, you can do that. We have realized uh, 
quantum non-demolition schemes where we can measure one quadrature of motion, avoid detection of the other, put all the back action effects into the other quadrature, uh, and see all that kind of physics. So all that works as well. So I can just keep on going. Uh, there's entanglement between the, the optical fields and the, and the mechanical motion. Uh, Andrew Cleland has this beautiful experiment where he exchanged one uh, single quanta from a qubit to the mechanics, back from the mechanics to the qubit, playing catch with a single h bar omega. And the, you know, the receiver is a little mechanical vibrating device. We, uh, been we've been focusing on squeezing the last few years. We can squeeze the motion of a plate uh, 4 dB below the zero point fluctuations. Um, and there's some really beautiful and subtle experiments where you can shine light on something, a mechanical device, and actually see that you're in the ground state. And you can see that the, the mechanical device can't absorb any, or can't emit anymore because there's no quanta there, but it can always absorb. And so that's uh, a, a, uh, the quantum limit of this kind of Raman process. Conclusion, quantum physics basically works for mechanical structures at 10 micron scale. So now where do we go next? What do we do? Well, you either start proposing engineering with these devices. A lot of people are, you know, here's a way uh, I can make a mechanical structure interact with an optical field and the same mechanical structure interact with a microwave field and with the dream of converting a single photon, uh, optical photon into a single microwave photon in order to couple a superconducting qubit out to an optical fiber. Okay, so that's what some people are thinking about using a mechanical element to do that. That's, that's uh, really interesting. Um, other things you can do is, well, what about the fundamental science? I'd like to just keep getting bigger, you know, just kind of uh, uh, stupidly just making bigger and bigger objects, quantum mechanical. It's just really fun. And I've been thinking about using superfluid resonators to do that. Um, so other things that haven't been done, there's no real measurements of decoherence beyond just uh, uh, regular old thermal kind of, uh, or lifetime decays, decoherence from lifetime, finite energy uh, decay. Uh, there's no uh, measurements yet of decoherence rates that would get into the limit of a Penrose mechanism for gravitational decoherence or any other sort of unknown or unexplained decoherence which might be responsible for this classical quantum divide, which we don't see. We don't see a classical quantum divide. We see quantum physics all the way, like turtles all the way, right? It's just, it's just quantum physics all the way so far. And, you know, where does it stop? We don't know. Okay. So this is what vibrates in our device. It's a little mechanical plate. It vibrates at typically like five megahertz. And you put it, you mix a capacitor with a bottom plate, and then there's a spiral inductor around that, forms a, a, a microwave resonator at like five gigahertz. So I apply some microwave photons into this thing. The mechanical motion modulates the frequency, and then I get some output field coming out there. If you, this is kind of uh, nanofabrication, uh, uh, I won't say it, but porn or whatever, but you know, you just kind of show lots of uh, pictures of, of uh, your nano devices. Mm -hmm. So that's what that is. And those are little crossovers in the coil. Students spend a lot of time and effort making these things that are difficult uh, to make, to actually fabricate. Turns out that you can write a Hamiltonian to describe the center of mass motion for this thing. This is the optomechanics Hamiltonian. And the, the device more or less behaves this way. And there's two quantum fields here. There's a single mode of the mechanics that we're trying to observe the quantum physics. And then there's the optical field, which we assume is quantum mechanical through you know, decades worth of quantum optics experiments. But essentially, there's quantum physics in two places, both in the mechanical motion and in the electromagnetic field. And so when you do the calculations, the input-output theory, you have to uh, look carefully at the quantum physics, both in the optics and the mechanics. This has caused some really interesting uh, papers that have made wrong statements where they claim to measure the, the quantum physics of the mechanics, but actually, if you do it right, they're measuring the quantum physics of the electromagnetic field. And it has to do with how you do the observations of whether you look at the, a linear detector or a photon detector and all that beautiful subtlety there. How you make the measurements changes the interpretation of what you're seeing. So anyway, that was really fun to sort out in experiments. The coupling that we have causes a Raman effect where you have a photon come in, you can absorb a mechanical quanta and have an upconverted photon. So if I pump here, I can upconvert into the electromagnetic cavity, or I could imagine shedding a photon and downconverting, and that's here. This process absorbs mechanical quanta and is how you cool your mechanical device down to the ground state. You apply light and you, you apply it with sufficient intensity to get a high enough rate 
that you can suck up all the quanta and just drive the mechanics down. And you, you're basically eating them all up. And you're up converting them to high frequency, throwing them away, and they never come back. So it's like, it's like an um, um, a, uh, atomic cooling or laser cooling. So here's the optical, um, sorry, the mechanical occupation versus how hard we're pumping our, 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 our electromagnetic resonator. And that coupling between the two, if it becomes uh, strong enough, the intensity of the field becomes strong enough, I can start up converting and cooling the mechanics. And eventually it goes below n equals 1. So if I could measure the number, I'd be more likely in the ground state. And the lowest that we see is something like a third. That's pretty typical. I think the lowest that's been seen is around 0.1. Um, and then eventually the cavity starts to heat up because it's in a microwave uh, frequency on a dilution fridge. It starts to get excited. And eventually uh, the microwaves start to heat up. But the minimum that we see is around a third. So we're in the ground state about 70% of the time. Um, you can apply two tones. And you can do all this back action evasion stuff, all this quantum non-demolition kind of measurements. So here's my electromagnetic cavity. Uh, at 5 gigahertz, here's my mechanical mode, and I can apply two carefully prepared tones, and the beat field inside the cavity is modulated at the mechanical frequency. And if you work through all the math, that has really beautiful effects that I get information of one quadrature, but put all the back action fluctuations from the electromagnetic field into the unobserved quadrature. And that's exactly what we see. So there's a lot to all this, you know, you can go through the papers, but this is the uh, sensitivity of the uh, observed quadrature, the one we're staring at near the uncertainty principle. And then if we apply a weak tone that we can just look carefully at the unobserved, we can see that the unobserved quadrature, you know, the one that we're just weakly coupled to, that one has all these huge fluctuations and it's phase dependent. And so indeed it works just like it's supposed to. The uncertainty pr principle fluctuations, we're routing them to a place uh, that, that don't disturb the measurement that we're trying to make, okay? So if you take the amplitude of this sine wave, this is how big the uncertainty principle fluctuations are from the light, and you plot them versus you know, the, the intensity of the field inside the cavity, the noise inside the cavity, there's a, a beautiful plot that comes out. It's, you know, it's hard to explain. But the point is, is that this or, the, the line here, how excited the, un, the unobserved quadrature gets, does not point to zero fluctuations. So meaning that when the cavity is empty, it still has noise. That's the uncertainty principle. So when the cavity is empty, it still forces motion on the mechanical device in the unobserved quadrature. This is the, um, uh, the empty cavity making forces. It's kind of like a single mode Casimir effect, if you think about it in that way. So the fact that the data, we can excite the cavity with noise and it po doesn't point at the origin means that an empty cavity actually still produces forces. So anyway, I can go on and on. These are, the, these are the kinds of results that are appearing in the field in the last couple years. Um, so anyone know this guy? This is Miles Blanco. He's at Dartmouth, uh, a good friend of mine. And this was on a, uh, he uh, goes on death marches with me through the Sierras of you know, 50 miles and through high mountain passes and all this kind of stuff. And so um, Miles and I spend time uh, thinking about stuff over the, over the last 15 years. And one of the really interesting things about mechanics that's still unresolved, that just wanted to seed it into this community, was that you can take a mechanical device and you can apply this light and cool it down to the ground state. Awesome. Yeah, okay, great. Maybe I can do some quantum physics with that, maybe quantum information or whatever. You can also excite it and drive it to high amplitude. And if you have a one gigahertz resonator, which is easy to, pretty easy to make in a clean room, oscillating at just a nanometer, the acceleration is something like 10 to the 9 Gs. So in this little device, which now is quantum mechanical, I can see the wave-like properties, I can also produce accelerations that are equivalent to uh, gravitational fields on the surface of a neutron star. Okay? So what do you do with that? I don't know. That's what for you guys to decide. Uh, Miles and I, you know, we're just thinking about stuff, and we just tried to think of some things. Um, he was looking at phase shifts that you would get in rings if one arm was really vibrating. But there's got to be some cool stuff that can be done in this regime, okay? So this is an un unexplored regime in this kind of physics that I think would be really fruitful to head to. Um, the other thing that we're trying to do is work with superfluid. And we're putting superfluid in a, in a gram scale, uh, you know, like a, a cup of superfluid inside a niobium cavity. The acoustic oscillations of the superfluid coupled to the microwave field of the cavity 
The microwave cavities, we get cues in those microwave cavities, uh, hand size, of around a third of a billion. And the world record at Cornell, which is done for accelerators, is 10 to the 11. So you can get incredibly high optical Q cavities. The helium is a superfluid. It moves without friction. But even at acoustic uh, uh, frequencies, there's a nonlinear mixing of the modes due to the, the, the interatomic, not the nonlinear part of the interatomic restoring forces. And you end up with a finite Q at acoustic frequencies. But nonetheless, we've demonstrated Q of 10 to the 8 at 8 kilohertz. And it looks like beyond 10 to the 10 is possible if we can make the sample cold enough. So you have a gram scale object that has um, incredible low Q or low dissipation in both electromagnetic and mechanical degrees of freedom. So we've been thinking about what to do with that. Here's what it looks like, kind of a Frankenstein thing, just like, you know, kind of typical Berkeley kind of low temperature thing. But it's a hand size object. So we've been trying to think about what to do with that. And the, one of the first things that comes to mind is people would ask, could you propose gravitational wave detection with a hand size object? I thought at first, this is crazy. You know, there's, there's just not enough mass there to couple to the, to the field. Um, so I started looking into it a little bit more. And there's, there's these beautiful pulsars that are spinning out there. And they, you know, they spin, they're you know, very precise clocks. Um, they expected to have off-axis mass spinning around. Um, you know, there's a, an anticipated kind of strain field here at Earth that should be detected. LIGO has not has looked for these. This was the whole point of the, of the Einstein at Home project and has not found them. Um, if you take our hand-sized device and you work through old papers looking at quadrupole coupling of little cylinders and all that kind of stuff, if you give us a month, let's say we could get 5 billion. You give us a month, we could, probably, we could measure a strain field of 10 to the minus 25. You give us a year, like LIGO, it'll integrate for a year, we're, at, we're in the 10 to the minus 26. So it's not completely nuts to think of hand-sized superfluid devices uh, looking for uh, gravitational waves from, let's say, pulsars. We know where to look. We know the frequencies, all that. OK, all right. Two questions. It's a short talk. First question, and the, uh, um, uh, the, the last talk uh, from, from New York. Um, first thing, when I when I'm backpacking, I, carried, I read this book. It was one of the best books I've ever read, uh, describing Gödel's proof to a person who knows a little math but is not a mathematician. And what I want to know is, can I set up an experiment in the laboratory where I know in principle it has no theory that's possible? That would be really interesting. Now, there's this paper that came out earlier this year that describes a Hamiltonian that they claim has this kind of uh, uh, undecidability. So that's heading that the right direction. I'd like to know, is there a quantum field, something beautiful, something perfect? Helium is nearly that. There's no impurities in helium besides just some isotopic impurities. Is there some system I can set in the lab that I know is totally, uh, I, can't, I can't know the theory for? Not as this too complicated, I just can't know. Second question, can we turn the relationship between math and physics around? Can we use uh, physics to decide any, uh, to actually go and make a measurement and determine any of the interesting conjectures? Is there an experiment that I could do that would tell me something about number theory? And answer it. I won't know why, but I'll know the answer. So can we turn this around? Can we just, instead of using physics, always math to describe physics, can we do some experimental math? So there you go. Those are, those, that's, uh, those are my two questions, and um, that's my talk. <laughs>